Hello, welcome to Western Civ, episode 215, Francis Surrounded. Last week we talked about Henry, Francis, and Charles up to around 1520. This week I want to focus almost exclusively on Francis. In the wake of his failed effort to win the imperial crown in 1519, Francis was struggling. He had won a major battle at Margiano, but now it seemed like that victory would count for very little. After all, Charles and Henry now effectively surrounded him. Plus, France had no money when Francis came to power and had even less now. This week, we look at France between 1520 and late 1524, as Francis deals with the realities of an Anglo-Imperial alliance and a potential rebellion at home. I want to begin this week's episode by talking about who Francis was a little bit. That is to say, what was his personality like? We struggle with this question so often in our time because we can't see the men and the women of the past like we can those after the advent of television or even radio for that matter. But Francis's personality is going to dictate to a large degree what's going to happen between 1520 and 1526. So we need to understand him, or at least we need to try. First and foremost, Francis wanted to establish himself as one of France's greatest kings. Everything that he did served, in his mind, to fulfill that ambition. He tried to dress the part early on, wearing sumptuous outfits, bedecked with luxurious furs and bright colors. He would have been an impossible man to miss in a room. He was, like Henry VIII, given to bawdy humor and loved practical jokes. He and his followers would speed, quote, daily through the streets of Paris disguised, throwing eggs, stones, and other foolish trifles at the people, which light demeanor of a king was much discommended and jested at, end quote. I wouldn't call throwing rocks at people a foolish trifle if I got hit in the head with a stone, but maybe that's just me. He was also without doubt a restless soul. Throughout his reign, Francis traveled across France, rarely staying in one place for more than a few months at a time. And when Francis traveled, the court traveled. This was no small affair. He traveled with a court and servants, upwards of 10,000 people. Francis, never a man to skimp on creature comforts, insisted that all the trappings of a king come with him. In terms of intelligence, Francis often gets compared, unfairly maybe, to his sister Marguerite, who was, safe to say, brilliant. Therefore, Francis looks downright slow, by comparison. But in reality, Francis was articulate and far from stupid. He appreciated the arts and literature. He wrote a number of poems, though none of them were really any good. Still, owing to the fact that he was, well, the king of France, several of his poems ended up being set to music. If Francis could not contribute to the Renaissance himself, he set himself out to be someone who could at the very least, patronize the best artists of the day. Francis was eager to participate in both the Renaissance and the humanist movement in any way that he could. Sometimes Francis's interests were practically esoteric. For example, he was fascinated by the occult, as many are today. But one cannot say he didn't have an eye for talent, Around 1515-1516, Francis met and convinced an aging Leonardo da Vinci to travel to France. Da Vinci did arrive in 1516, 
and spent the rest of his life at Francis's court. Though he did not, as a later painting would suggest, die in Francis's arms. Da Vinci, in fact, died on May the 2nd, 1519, while Francis was attending to the birth of his much-anticipated second son. Francis was not with da Vinci when the old genius died, but he did acquire the paintings that da Vinci had on hand when he died. These included such masterpieces as The Virgin of the Rocks, St. John, and, of course, the Mona Lisa, which is why the Mona Lisa hangs in the Louvre today and not in Florence. Francis was also very interested in Renaissance architecture. Da Vinci himself helped to design the new palace at Chambord, though it would not be completed in either man's lifetime. In addition to art and architecture, it has often been said that Francis had two great loves in his life, hunting and women. And yes, to be clear, those are separate. Francis was rather careless when it came to pursuing women. In his youth, when just the heir apparent to the throne, he would often don a disguise and go out gallivanting through the streets of Paris at night, though he was certainly placing himself in harm's way by doing so. Paris, like any early modern city, had no police force and was not safe at night. Francis's queen, Claudet, accepted his philandering. She was, according to sources, no great beauty, but she was charming, good-natured, and kind. Crucially, unlike, as we will see, Anne Boleyn, she was not prone to jealousy. She accepted both her lot in life and Francis as he was. And speaking of Claudet, she delivered Francis his first much-longed-for son, on February the 28th, 1518. Throughout much of his reign, Francis would follow a fixed routine that combined business and pleasure. If not traveling, he would rise around 10 a.m. and hear Mass. It was certainly the part of the day Francis enjoyed most, because it was likely the only time he was free from the concerns of state and not pestered by anyone. Francis, as I mentioned, loved hunting. He had since he was a boy, and always made sure to incorporate it on any progress. Around 150,000 gold crowns were spent per year maintaining the royal hunting grounds. However, Francis's life was not without his troubles. His eldest daughter, Charlotte, died on September the 21st, 1517, ending her engagement to Charles V. All in all, Francis was absolutely a new kind of king for France. He was the kingdom's first humanist king and wanted badly to bring France into the modern age, even though I should note he was a religious conservative and remained so throughout his life. The first half decade within which Francis held power had gone very well for him. Still, from Francis's decision to once more involve France in the turbulent politics of northern Italy, to his choice to challenge Charles in the imperial election of 1519, Francis's past actions would come back to haunt him in the subsequent decade. Historians in the past have referred to the period from 1520 to 1530 in French history as, quote, the time of tears and sorrows. For Francis, it would bring unimaginable shame and humiliation. Francis's major problem was Charles. The new Holy Roman Emperor was growing more powerful by the day, consolidating Habsburg holdings across Europe and the New World. Francis knew he needed to counter this. He did have one advantage, in that Charles's domains were spread throughout Europe, and the amount of allegiance each gave the emperor varied depending on the kingdom in question. Still, 
The bottom line was that Charles had an empire while Francis did not. Now going back to Italy for a second, the boot was considered to be the key to any serious attempt to rule all of Europe. This just kind of goes back to the old Roman biases. French held Milan was now really the only impediment to Charles controlling all of northern Italy, and from there it would be simple to unite the north with Naples, swallowing up the unsteady papal states in between. This made it highly likely that Charles would make an attempt at Milan at some point in the future, and Francis knew that. The smart move for Francis would have been to lead his forces in a defensive capacity. If he struck out from Milan toward Rome and managed to establish French control there, then Charles' options no longer looked as rosy. It was one thing to march an army from Naples straight to Milan with papal backing, but quite another if you have to fight all the way up the Italian boot. Unfortunately for Francis, this defensive option wasn't really on the table. His previous wars left his treasury bankrupt, and there were even allegations swirling that he and Luis had misused public funds. There simply wasn't enough money for another campaign. Of course, it didn't help that Francis had paid for the field of the Cloth of Gold pageant with Henry VIII on credit, and that it would take Francis a decade just to repay that useless endeavor. Another problem I should mention is Francis's almost insane insistence to consistently prove himself through strenuous exercise, which had resulted in a number of near-death experiences, including one in which the French king was nearly set ablaze. His son was still hardly out of infancy. Was this the time for Francis to leave the kingdom again on another wild adventure? Francis' solution was to wage war by proxy. It wasn't ideal, but it was much, much cheaper. And this was possible in 16th century Europe, by the way. Rulers could just go out and hire a condottieri, a mercenary captain in charge of his own private army. Then said army would do the bidding, more or less, of the person who hired in an exchange for a cash payment. Oh, and the prospect of plunder. Condottieri were in it for the money, so they always plundered wherever they went. Condottieri were often associated with northern Italy, but they existed in France as well. And so in February 1521, Francis struck a deal with one such condottieri, Robert de la Marque, who, in exchange for a cash payment of 10,000 écus, agreed to invade Luxembourg. Luxembourg was part of the ancestral Habsburg domains. So when de la Marque attacked in March, Francis was effectively waging war by proxy. It didn't work. By April, Charles's brilliant general, Henri, Count of Nassau, had expelled de la Marque, and Charles, who was not a gullible man, was sending emissaries accusing Francis of having paid these mercenaries and warning of serious consequences should it happen again. Making matters worse, and I alluded to this in the last episode, a French army under the command of André de Foix, after having some success in Navarre, decided to press on into Castile. This was a grave miscalculation. The Castilian army, fresh from quelling the Comuniero rebellion, quickly wheeled north and routed the invading French at the Battle of Esquiros on June the 30th. De Foix lost an eye for his trouble. But if all this wasn't bad enough... Ongoing events in Italy were truly devastating for Francis. Pope Leo, like everyone else, could see that Charles was the new man of the hour. Francis was old news. 
so Leo decided to switch his allegiance. In a secret treaty signed May the 29th, 1521, Leo and Charles agreed that Charles would be crowned Holy Roman Emperor in Rome and that, simultaneously, he would be granted the Kingdom of Naples. For those of you who think this is going to herald in a new period of peace and cooperation between Charles and the papacy, uh, don't jump to conclusions. But as you can imagine, the so-called secret treaty did not remain secret for very long. By early July, Francis was aware of its contents and furious. Francis announced that, henceforth, all French ecclesiastical revenue would stay in France. Moreover, he threatened Leo that he, quote, would ere long enter Rome and impose laws on the Pope, end quote. Frankly, this was little more than the tit-for-tat diplomacy that had characterized relations between the Pope and the French king for centuries. Francis did get one immediate benefit out of the deal, however. He demanded instant payment from all Florentine banks operating in France to the tune of 100,000 livres. The Florentine bankers quickly paid up. Historian Lenny Frida was right when she wrote that this money was, quote, quite literally, a godsend. Francis was beginning to realize that the throne of Naples was unlikely ever to be his. So he focused instead on maintaining his position in Milan. Meanwhile, in England, Henry VIII made it known that he was willing to act as a royal arbitrator between Francis and Charles, lest Europe be plunged into total war. So Cardinal Wolsey went to Calais, where on July the 20th, 1521, he met with delegations from France and the Empire. Francis's representatives told Wolsey that they just wanted peace, not a truce, a lasting peace. What they failed to mention, of course, was that said peace was really more of a financial necessity for Francis at this point than an altruistic desire. But when Wolsey went to speak with Charles's people, things got interesting. The imperial camp told the English cardinal flat out that they had zero interest in peace. Francis had launched two perfidious expeditions against Charles. This was all Francis's fault. Would, they asked, England be interested in joining an immediate crusade to punish the French king? Wolsey agreed to their terms so quickly that historians have wondered ever since whether or not war was his intention from the get-go. By mid-August, Wolsey was in Bruges, where he signed a treaty on Henry's behalf, allying England with the Habsburgs. The deal stipulated that if Franco-imperial difficulties remained by the end of autumn, that England would enter the war on Charles's side. Both sides were committed to putting substantial forces into the field, at least 40,000 men each. Now, at the same time, Charles let it be known through his emissaries that he did remain willing to commit to a peace treaty. Were this true, it would have been a great relief to the cash-strapped Francis, but it wasn't. On August the 20th, 1521, Charles's forces, under the command of the capable general, the Count of Nassau, attacked Spain's northeast border with France. Nassau took the town of Mezirs after a three-week siege and then overran nearby Ardes. Back in Calais, where, technically, Francis and Charles's emissaries were still working on an agreement, everyone finally gave up. The ruse of the peace negotiations was over. And, frankly, why should Charles negotiate? He knew Francis was virtually bankrupt. He had England set to intervene in several months. There seemed almost no chance of losing. Francis did what he could. He assembled a large army at Reims and marched south. Nassau, believing Francis would not be able to keep so large an army in the field for very long, pulled back. 
It was the first good news for Francis in a long time. Suddenly, what had begun as a war of defense started to turn into a string of successes. The Kingdom of Navarre, with French support, kept the Spanish at bay. In northern Italy, the French took Parma. Then, amazingly, the French succeeded in capturing the key Spanish town of Fuenterrabia, a coastal town on the French border. Fuenterrabia was long thought to be the gateway to Spain. Hearing the news, Cardinal Wolsey began to have second thoughts. His only goal was to make sure that England was on the winning side of any war. He had no interest in involving the English in a long and expensive war on the continent. He began pressuring the imperial side to come to terms with Francis before, you know, England actually had to make good on its treaty obligations and enter the combat. Charles also wanted peace, believing now that maybe he had underestimated Francis. And Francis, therefore, should have won. But like any addicted gambler, he couldn't leave the table. Having raised an army, he wanted to put it to use and avenge those whom he believed had wronged him. Never mind that Francis was clearly to blame for provoking this war, but that's beside the point. Francis told an aide, quote, Ye see what charge I am at, and also how my men eat up my subjects? Wherefore I will march on straight, and live upon their counties, as they have done on mine. Francis was about to overplay his hand. Disaster soon replaced triumph. Francis failed to relieve the siege at Tournai in modern-day Belgium in October of 1521. On November the 1st, he ordered a retreat, and nine days later, against the advice of his generals, he disbanded his army. Hearing the news, Tournai promptly surrendered. Back in Milan, a lack of money and the perceived cruelty of the French meant that there was no love lost when an imperial force broke through the fortifications on November the 19th. By the end of 1521, Charles's men had pushed the French out of northern Italy. On November 24th, Wolsey reaffirmed the treaty that would see England enter the war. Francis, facing a coalition of Europe's two most powerful forces, remained defiant. On a gambler's high, he had pushed his luck too far, and it had left him. But sticking with the gambling metaphor, Francis still had cards left to play. England had to mobilize, and that would take time. Francis decided to try a little bit of diplomacy against Henry VIII, and he did so masterfully. He wrote to Henry that, given that the English king was now allied with the emperor and an enemy of France, it was inappropriate for him to continue to receive a French pension. So Francis was cutting him off. When Henry complained, Francis feigned ignorance, saying the money would get there soon. Still, this had the effect of delaying Henry's decision to mobilize, which is exactly what Francis wanted. Simultaneously, Francis revived the Auld Alliance, trying to get Scotland to distract the English militarily. On the continent, Francis was also not completely without options. Many of the Swiss cantons, you will recall, had taken French gold and were still allied to the French king. So in January 1522, 16,000 Swiss pikemen descended the Alpine passes into northern Italy. It seemed Francis was not done gambling, after all. In Italy, Francis left the campaign to General Lautrec, a brilliant military commander. Initially, things went well, and Lautrec, reinforced with 16,000 Swiss, was able to bring significant swaths of Lombardy back under French control, despite runaway anti-French sentiment in the region. But everyone knew that the key to the region was Milan, and the campaign would count for nothing unless Lautrec took the city. Unfortunately, 
the former Duke Francisco Sforza, had returned to the city the previous year, and combined with substantial cash payments, he had managed to keep the citizens loyal to himself and the emperor. Lutrec would ultimately be unable to take Milan, leading Francis to fume that if the situation did not improve, then he would head to Italy himself and take command. Trying to save face, Lutrec attempted a siege of Pavia, but under the command of the powerful Colonna family, a Milanese army sallied forth to break Lutrec's attempted siege. Lutrec, unnerved by this development, abruptly broke off the siege and tried to march north. Colonna dogged him and his forces as they moved and established impressive entrenchments at nearby La Bichoa. The breastworks had raised platforms for artillery fires and were surrounded by deep ditches. It would be utter folly to attempt a direct assault. Lutrec, however, had no alternative. The Swiss mercenaries demanded they either be put into action or sent home. So Lutrec ordered a frontal assault. The Swiss, in their usual style, marched straight up to the Imperial guns on April the 27th, 1522, and got blasted to smithereens. They lost, in one day, about 20% of their total strength around 3,000 men. Those who did not die gave up and returned to Switzerland. It was a lasting humiliation and another indication that the age of the pike was over and the age of the gun at hand. Subsequently, the word bikoa, meaning something acquired at little to no cost, entered the Spanish language. A French-dominated northern Italy still easily within Francis's reach in 1521, disappeared from the map. Lautrec returned to France, where his king berated him for his failure. After the debacle in Italy in April 1522, it was inevitable that Cardinal Wolsey would choose to continue England's entente with the empire. So it came as no surprise when a herald showed up at the French court on May the 29th, 1522, to issue a formal declaration of hostilities between England and France. At first, this meant very little. All Henry seemed content to do was allow the Calais garrison to sally forth and lay waste to the surrounding Picard countryside. The French did little to stop them at first. Eventually, the English ran out of supplies to go further, and a vigorous counteroffensive arrived, which drove the English back to Calais. For a moment, at the same time, by the way, it seemed like Francis might be able to strike a deal in Ireland with the Earl of Desmond. He offered, for the right price, to attack the Pale, the English colony situated around Dublin. But then Desmond became distracted by launching forays against his neighboring tribal Irish opponents, and the whole affair came to nothing. For the rest of 1522, Francis was occupied with the recapture of Milan. Unfortunately, what few allies he had were scattered the following spring. For his part, when Charles V returned to Spain in July of 1522, he did so with massive debts, an ego nearly the size of the Holy Roman Empire, and an understanding that he had to make peace with his Castilian subjects. Immediately, he began negotiating with the towns and elites to determine what he needed to do to get their support. To a large extent, he already knew what he had to do, and he did it. Charles would remain in Spain for the next seven years, roughly, until 1529. He would convene the Cortes with more regularity, and he will, after four years of negotiation, Mary Isabella of Portugal. Back in Rome, it was time for the Pope to formally choose a side. Pope Leo died on December the 1st, 1521. So was Pope Adrian IV, who decided to join the Anglo-Imperial Alliance. Augmented by Venice, Adrian announced a papal intention to defend Italy from any French attack. Francis 
was effectively boxed in. Charles surrounded him to the southwest, the east, and the northeast. To the northwest, Henry still held Calais. And now this new anti-French, papal-backed league effectively precluded any further adventures in that direction. Couple all this with the enormous deficit his kingdom faced, and Francis was really up against the wall. However, the belligerent attitudes of Henry and Charles left the French king with little choice but to try to keep gambling. Early modern battles were extremely risky, but if he prevailed, Francis could still turn the tables. He had to resort to selling sacred plate and royal jewels, but the French king managed to raise enough funds for yet one more throw of the dice. Francis proceeded to name his mother Louise, regent in his absence, as he had seven years earlier. He took his queen with him and then traveled to Blois. Leaving Claudet there, Francis continued toward the Alps, which he planned to cross as soon as possible. But then he stopped. News reached Francis of some very disturbing treason within his own camp. He wasn't going anywhere, at least not until this was dealt with. The news was about as bad as it could have been. For reasons that are unbelievably complex, none other than Charles III, the Duke of Bourbon, the Constable of France, was conspiring with Charles V, Holy Roman Emperor, to overthrow his sovereign king. Bourbon was a significant figure in France, and it rankled him that his claim to the throne was arguably more convincing than Francis's. Francis's relations with Bourbon were more diplomatic over the years than close. Still, we cannot forget for a moment that Bourbon played a major role in the French victory at Marigiano. Moreover, Bourbon had been the lieutenant general of Milan during Francis's early occupation of the city and had performed immaculately. But the reality was, for a variety of smaller reasons I won't get into, Bourbon was so diseffective that he was now willing to betray his king for the emperor. Francis's first move was to summon the duke before him and get to the truth of the matter. Bourbon denied everything, but Francis was insistent. By May of 1523, Bourbon confided in his friend the Bishop of Le Pieux that he did not believe he could get fair treatment from Francis, though, to be fair, he was conspiring to remove Francis as king, so I'm not 100% sure I understand his definition of the word fair. Regardless, he told Le Pieux that he would return the constable's sword and flee, allegedly, with 1,000 other nobles to Germany. Once, Bourbon had been a master tactician on the battlefield for Francis. Now, he sought to use that same tactical ability for self-preservation. He would hopefully play Francis and Charles off one another to save himself and for the benefit of his family. In May of 1523, Bourbon and Charles signed a secret treaty of agreement. The idea was that the Duke would lead a major domestic rebellion against Francis, with his own forces, supplemented by 10,000 mercenaries sent by the Emperor. Charles would then invade France from the south, while, ostensibly, King Henry would insist in the invasion by attacking Normandy. Charles even offered Bourbon a subsidy of 100,000 gold crowns to sweeten the deal. Henry was actually included in all these battle plans, despite the fact that the English ambassadors arrived too late to agree to any of it, or even sign the treaty. If there was any chance that Bourbon would remain loyal and could be flipped back, that ended in August 1523. Acting now as regent, Louis's government declared that Bourbon was to be stripped of all lands and titles except a token allowance of 4,000 livres. The judgment meant that nothing now stood between Bourbon and the Anglo-Imperial alliance that seemed poised to intervene militarily on his behalf. There are records, though, from the time, and I don't know how much emphasis we should put on them, but they do indicate that Bourbon was still eager 
to strike some sort of an accord with Francis. Whether this was out of residual loyalty or a desire to improve his negotiating position with respect to Charles, we don't know. As Francis prepared to leave for Milan, everything was set to happen. Once Francis left his kingdom, everyone would spring the trap and he would be defeated before he could even get home. Francis felt like he had one final card to play. If he left the kingdom with Bourbon still behind him, he might well be unable to return. If he dealt with Bourbon too harshly, he might look like a tyrant. After all, the Duke had denied all the charges of treason. So Francis went to see Bourbon one last time before leaving. He found the Duke sick and in bed, perhaps overcome with nerves, we're not sure. Regardless, Francis told Bourbon everything he knew, but assured the Constable of France that he didn't believe a word of it. However, Francis continued, he could very much use the help of France's greatest general in the battles to come in Italy. Would he not accompany Francis as he had before, when the two had won at Margiano? It was a brilliant move. If Bourbon refused to come, then it would be proof of his treason. If Bourbon came along, then there could be no rebellion. Bourbon caught checkmate, begged for one week to decide citing his sickness. Francis, satisfied that his sickness was not a ruse, agreed, but he left behind an envoy who would remind Bourbon of his duties and bring the duke to Francis when the time came. A frantic Bourbon then met with an English envoy later that same day in secret. Bourbon was choosing conflict. He would betray his king. Seven days passed, and the constable of France failed to show up at Lyon, as promised. Royal officials moved in and arrested three of his senior advisors. But for the Duke himself, Francis continued to exercise some patience. Francis sent messages to the Duke offering more olive branches and simply asking Bourbon to explain himself. On the 7th of September, Bourbon fled to one of his mansions, he was kind of in a bind at this point. The promised imperial mercenaries had not arrived. Neither Charles nor Henry had initiated any kind of invasion. Nor would any of the other great magnates of the French realm support Bourbon's cause. It seemed as though he had overplayed his hand. With no other option, Bourbon disguised himself as a servant and fled to the empire. By early October, he was over the Rhone, and then made his way to saint claude a mountainous district that lay safely within the empire. His treason was complete. Francis, now really without a choice, acted swiftly in retaliation. It was said that, quote, no one ever saw any man so overcome with rage. On September 11th, 30 of Bourbon's accomplices were arrested. Francis placed a 10,000 Iku ransom on Bourbon's head. It was soon clear that the rebellion was much less widespread than first feared, but Francis wanted to make an example out of anyone complicit. So he ordered anyone captured in connection with the plot tortured, in the hope that they might reveal any accomplices. As far as the Grand Anglo-Imperial Alliance, set to finish off Francis once and for all, it never materialized. Sure, Henry sent the Duke of Suffolk with 12,000 to Calais with instructions to march overland to Paris, which he did. But the expected imperial reinforcements never arrived. Still, the people of Paris would blame Francis for the rest of his reign, for the fact that the English might have attacked, and he did not come back to their aid he left a subordinate in command of his capital city. It's a blemish that still haunts Francis's record within France to this day. And honestly, the English invasion might have worked had Charles showed up. But for all his promises, the perennially cash-strapped emperor had been forced to abandon his plans. 
leaving Suffolk and his men to suffer through a bitterly cold December before marching back to Calais. Bourbon now fled to Italy. Even if he had managed to keep order at home, there is no doubt that Francis's foreign policy was becoming more chaotic by the minute. Francis remained in France during the winter of 1523-24 to deal with the aftermath of the rebellion. That meant that the army in northern Italy faced the monumental task of taking Milan, now defended by Bourbon, one of the greatest military minds of the age, and lacked any inspirational leadership Francis might have brought. The only good news was that the Pope had died again. Adrian IV died at 64, before he had even served two years. His replacement, Clement VII, advocated peace between France and the Empire. But this wouldn't be enough to save what looked to be an increasingly doomed campaign. There seemed little chance for peace. Charles demanded Burgundy in exchange for Milan, but this would have put imperial power in the heart of eastern France. Francis's demand was that he'd only consider peace if Bourbon was handed over to him. That was equally unlikely to happen. Especially, of course, given that the French army wasn't doing well in Italy. On April the 30th, 1524, a French force attempted to cross the river Sessia and was badly beaten and suffered massive casualties. In the end, of the 1,500 cavalrymen who left France for Italy, less than a quarter returned. As for Bourbon, rather than attempt to return to France, he decided to throw in 100% with the Anglo-Imperial Alliance. He agreed to support Henry VIII's claim to the French throne. Suddenly, the man who had been the second leading military official in France was supporting an English king for the French throne. His fee for all this was 200,000 gold crowns to be paid equally by Charles, who absolutely did not have that kind of money, and Henry VIII, who probably did. In early July 1524, Bourbon advanced back into France at the head of an imperial army of 20,000 men. He was able to take several key towns in Provence, and had Henry pushed the matter, he might actually have become king of France. But Wolsey cautioned restraint. Suffolk's invasion the year before had not been greeted kindly by the French people, so Wolsey cautioned a wait-and-see approach. For the emperor's part, his forces still sat in Catalonia, making no indication they intended to move forward. But Bourbon pressed on anyway. He began a siege of Marseille on August the 19th, 1524, but the city held out. It had a garrison of 8,000 men, plus a citizen defense corps of around the same number. And it had the French Navy docked outside the city for firepower. A letter from Francis promised relief, and there were rumors that he was on his way south with a massive 40,000-man strong army. When Bourbon's imperial mercenaries told him they wanted to withdraw, he had no choice but to order a retreat. By October the 1st, 1524, the French had regained control over most of Provence. No one could feel good about any of this. Bourbon had effectively lost everything unless Francis could be overthrown. Francis had lost Milan and all of its surrounding lands. And more personal tragedy followed. On July 20th, 1524, Queen Claudette died of tuberculosis. She had produced several children for Francis, but one of those then died of measles at the age of seven on September 18, 1524. Still, next week, Francis and the Kingdom of France suffered through a disaster, the likes of which had not hit the kingdom since the Hundred Years' War. Next week, the Battle of Pavia. If you'd like more content, check out the website, link in the show notes. If you're looking for ad-free versions of the show and bonus content, look at the Patreon page. And 
If you want a free trial of Western Civ 2.0, you can click the link in the show notes at glow.fm forward slash Western Civ. You get seven day free trial. We're already getting close to the Greek and Persian Wars. Always a fun topic and something I can't wait to do again.